Hey, good morning. My name is Blake Hodges. I'm the pastor here at East Campus. If you don't know me, and I want to urge you uh, to turn your Bible to Mark chapter 7. As we continue to walk through the book of Mark, looking at really big uh, chunks of Scripture all at once, just really being drawn more and more into an understanding of the identity of Jesus Christ and an appropriate, really, response to him. Um, I just wanted to mention there's a lot that's gone on this week. I mean, we talk in pipe bombs uh, to people's houses in the mail. We're talking about two people, I believe, dead at a J-Town Kroger here in Louisville. And then yesterday you have at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 11 confirmed as deceased in what is being called the greatest attack on uh, Jews in the nation of America since the inception of our country. Um, There's a lot of sin, isn't there? And you know, as I was thinking about all these things, as we see these things and they come into our life and I mean, they're heavy. What is, what is the, what's the problem? What is going on? And it's interesting when these things happen, if if there's one thing that we can collectively agree on, not only as a body of believers in this room, but I would say almost pretty much worldwide, if there's something we can agree on, that's amazing that that could ever be said true of anything that we could agree on as a world, but it's that there's something wrong. Something is wrong with us. Something is imperfect about us. No matter what walk of life, what philosophy of life, like what kind of worldview you have, pretty much anybody is willing to admit a flaw in the nature of, a, in nature of humans. Now, they may refer to it differently. Somebody who's entrenched in the biological sciences or the sciences of chemistry, the empirical sciences, they might say, hey, what is our problem is that our knowledge is finite of the cosmos. Like we just don't understand enough. Philosophers might give various answers. Then obviously you got like how many religions? I don't even know. A bunch. A bunch of religions all claiming to speak into what is our fundamental problem and how we deal with it. Like what's wrong with us? How do we fix ourselves? Because we all know inherently something's just off. You see, in Mark 7... These guys, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they know, they know very well something is imperfect about them, something is wrong with them. And this entire text is really about their horrible attempts of trying to fix what's wrong with them the right way. That's where we're going. What is wrong with us? What's our problem? In the wrong ways, we try to fix ourselves. Mark chapter seven, if you would stand in the honor of God's word as we read verses one through 13. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. There are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down in many such things that you do. Let's pray. Lord God, please, would you reveal the traditions in our hearts? God, they're they're deceptive to us. 
that are evasive, but God, I pray you would well up through your word today in our hearts where we think we are externally washing ourselves, God. And I pray you would press us down that we see our true nature, our true problem. And God, we would come out of here worshiping you in spirit and truth and lifting you up and recognizing you as the only means by which we are fixed. Lord, please would you speak to us through your word, God, by the power of your spirit. I ask for your help to communicate, to preach. God, please help me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So if I could title this sermon, maybe, culturally for us, I would say, trying to fix yourself. (laughs) Then maybe that's what I would call it. Um, But really, where we're going is really trying to answer this question. If we look up here, get a slide, what is wrong with us? Look at really two big, two big things, verses one through 13, how we attempt to fix ourselves, contrasted in verses of 14 through 23 of what we actually need. Okay, so as we're looking at verses one through 13 and we're thinking about how we attempt to fix ourselves, what we're zoning in on here right here is how the Pharisees are trying to fix themselves. Okay, because if you understand the entirety of the chapter seven of the gospel of Mark, it's all about the same thing. There's a lot of discourse and then there's two miracles at the end, but even the miracles, everything is tied into one question. And that one question for them is this, how do we become clean? How do we become clean? Okay, so be careful. I want to lose you right here because that's not cultural, culturally a question that we ask. We, we're not walking around saying, how do I become clean? But this question, how do I become clean, is a manifestation of a, what's deeper going on in our lives. And it's manifested in different cultures in different ways. Okay, maybe your, the question for you is not, how do I become clean? Maybe it's this, how do I become holy versus being unholy? Maybe how, how, do I, how am I forgiven versus being sinful? How if I'm broken, can I be made whole? How if I'm broken, can I be mended? If I'm weak, how can I be made strong? If I'm discontent, how can I be fulfilled? You see the pattern? They're asking about cleanness, which is definitely a concept in the Old Testament, but the way this manifests itself in each culture is different. A lot of times it's different based on what we value. Okay, but they're asking this question, what must we do to become clean? And they got some awesome strategies for it, as we just read about. They're really effective. Um, they're gonna wash some pots and bowls, okay? So we can kind of laugh at it, we kind of look back at it. Um, but if we're thinking about cleanness, we kind of have a hard time identifying with that. So let me try to illustrate what this means. I want you to pretend that you get invited to one of the most prestigious weddings that has ever taken place. I mean, it's like a big wedding and they're having fillets wrapped with bacon all over the place. And you know, you're trying to get in that wedding reception. You know, this is a huge wedding. I mean, it's a people of great status. And wow, you have such the status that you got invited to this prestigious wedding, but it's at night. And here's the one requirement. It's black tie. You gotta be looking good. You gotta be dressed to the nines. You feel me? You you gotta be looking good for this wedding. Gotta have the right attire. And so you come in, people are all going into the wedding and you show up and the bouncer says, what are you doing? You're not welcome in here. And you're like, why not? And he says, look at yourself. And what you have is a flannel, jeans, boots, and you're covered in manure. Like you're not coming in here to defile our wedding. You're unclean. You're dirty. You're polluted. You're unacceptable. You're not acceptable in here because you do not have the right attire. This is the idea of cleanness. Okay, they're a very small level because what this is ultimately picturing, what the Jews are ultimately concerning about is being clean before a morally perfect God who is holy and pure and there is no pollution or stain to his character whatsoever that unless you're clean, you cannot come into his presence. Okay, so that's what they're thinking. We think about it in different ways in our culture, but they're thinking there's a, 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 their whole tradition is based on trying to fix some of these things. Go. So they take some stabs at it, okay? And here's what I wanna do. I wanna spend a little time looking at the pattern of what it looks like to try to make yourself clean with external action, patterned at their behavior. And when we do that, then I wanna just bring it into our culture and show that these guys may look silly to us, but we do a lot of the very same things. Okay, so let's look at what they're doing. Look first at verse two. They saw that 
some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, unclean. He even says that is unwashed. Okay, so the first sign, you might be holding to the traditions of men, the ways of men, superseding the word of God, against the word of God, is if your focus is external. The focus on the action is external to begin with. Look at then at verse five. And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So this is something they're taking from Jewish tradition passed down. If you read in the Mishnah, in Jewish tradition, which is a collection of saying of rabbinical writings, you would see that there were Jews at this time, and many will still say today, that if you do not obey the traditions of the elders, I mean, you are worse than a lawbreaker. Okay, so this was very serious. They took their traditions very seriously, but not only is the focus external, but they're judging now the disciples according to their external standard. So here's what happens, not, here's what happens next. Not only is the focus external when you're trying to do external action to cleanse ourselves, but it becomes the standard by which we judge everybody else and how we evaluate whether everyone, anyone else is acceptable and holy and clean. But verse six, Jesus says this, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So it's external. The external things becomes the standard by which we judge ourselves and others, but it's got God sprinkled in it, like a little salt and pepper. You know, make it, make it flavorful. We got a little God in there, got to make sure because don't want people questioning us is what they're thinking. This is scriptural, right? This is biblical. We need to be clean. So God's thrown in the mix. But then in verse Eight, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. He actually goes on to say in verse nine, we don't have this on the slide, but it says, you have a fine way. You have a sly way. You have a crafty way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. So here's the pattern. Trying to fix what's wrong with us in the wrong way. It's externally focused. The external focus has become the standard. It's got God sprinkled in it, so it looks really pretty on the outside but it ultimately diverts from true obedience to the Lord. And that's the example he gives. He quotes the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, and says how they've created this really weird loophole where they don't, have to, they don't actually have to honor their family and help them. So, <clears throat> so far, we're really abstract still, I think. We're not into our experience yet, but I wanna tell you something before we go into our experience. One, I wanna say, this text and next week's text are both really hard. <laughs> They're really hard texts, okay? Um, so we prepare our heart for this when the word of God comes in. But in Matthew's parallel account, in uh, Matthew chapter 15, after Jesus gets done saying this to them, the disciples say, Jesus, um, do you not know they were offended when you said this? Like, you know, you know this. You not know they were offended, Jesus? And Jesus says, every tree that my heavenly father is not planted will be rooted up. What's he saying? He said, I don't care if they're offended. If they reject this, they're rejecting the word of God is his position. So I think today as we're gonna work through some things, there may be some things that I'm hopefully gonna try to faithfully pull out of our cultural experience in America and see how we do the same things. I just wanna be aware, like in some level, you should feel some discomfort this morning. I felt discomfort for the last seven days over this thing, <laughs> over so many issues. But first to see that traditionalism is really easy to identify in the past, isn't it? Some of y'all could grown up, hey, don't drink, don't smoke, don't see R-rated movies, don't listen to Metallica, go burn the CDs, don't dance. And, and we look at those and we say, oh, that was kind of silly, that was, that was traditional. But it's really deceptive to see tradition in your own context because it's your blind spot. It's really hard to see it, but we need to ask the questions, what are the ways that we're most concerned about being fixed in our lives? And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna pull out three ways I think we do this, okay? The first of which <clears throat> is self-actualization. So when I say this, I mean self-actualization with Christianity mixed in it. Okay, so if I could think about the one question that most Americans are asking in a different way, maybe you'd phrase it different, is how can I be fulfilled about who I am? How can I be fulfilled? How can I find contentment? How can I find pleasure? Man, that is the question for our generation, okay? And so 
ultimately, that's just another question. How can I go from being unfulfilled to fulfilled? Okay, so what we do, what happens is in the circles of the church, we confess Jesus is Lord, he's everything, all I have is Christ, but how am I gonna find fulfillment? Oh, well, I'm gonna find fulfillment in him, but then practically we go pursue contentment and pleasure and fulfillment everywhere else but him and embrace the traditional mindset of how fulfillment occurs, how we move out of brokenness, self-actualization. Where am I getting this phrase? I'm getting this phrase from a guy named Abraham Maslow. Has anybody ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? A lot of people in this room, you probably taught it in school, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of of different things that you need in your life to reach a point at the top, which is you being self-actualized, meaning you reaching the fullness of your creative potential, your social potential, social potential, your intellectual potential. Hey, when you just embrace yourself and through your personal effort, you just get there, you're gonna be content at that point. It sounds really exciting. He says this, I think we have it up here. Yeah, what a man can be, he must be. He wrote that in his theory of human motivation, talking about why all humans are motivated to do what they do, to find fulfillment, I think. What a man can be, he must be. Let me translate that to 2018 language. Be yourself. Okay? Now, when I say that, I want you to hear me. We are image bearers of God, and he has made us unique, and amen, that according to the glory of Christ, when we pursue him and we pursue our gifts that he has given us, that is a beautiful thing to be unique in the image of God and pursue him in that endeavor. But I'm not talking about that kind of be yourself. I'm talking to American culturalism, be yourself. And so just to say, you know, Maslow wrote the 1940s, but I want us to feel this, that this is what is marketed in Christian circles. Um, There's this girl who wrote this book recently Her name is Rachel Hollis, and it's very recent, but published this year. Her name is Rachel Hollis, and she wrote a book called Girl, Wash Your Face. Girl, Wash Your Face. Okay, let's stop right there. What were the Pharisees trying to do in this text? Wash. So you know this ain't gonna end good, okay? You know it's not. It can't. Book is Girl, Wash Your Face, New York Times bestseller published by a Christian company in a Christian bookstore about how you achieve your best self with a little God sprinkled in. Let me read you some quotes out of this book. Here here we go. You are meant to be the hero of your own story. You should be the very first of your priorities. Now, guys, it doesn't take a biblical rocket scientist to know that that is like out in, I don't even know where. You're meant to be the hero? Really? You read Romans 3, verse 10? You ain't no hero, you a villain. Your priorities should be first. You should be the first of your priorities. Look where that got Eve in the garden. Let me read you some more stuff. Look, Look at this one. I'm a big fan of displaying visuals inside my closet door to remind me every single day of what my aim is. Currently taped to my door, the cover of Forbes featuring self-made female CEOs, vacation house in Hawaii, and a picture of Beyonce, obvi. That means obviously. (laughs) So we read this and the reason you're laughing so hard is because it's so stupid. That's why you're laughing hard is because you get it. What are you gonna bring before God? Look at my vacation house, God. He's like, um, I'm the CEO of Jupiter, okay? Like, you know, you're not bringing anything to me that like impresses me. That's her aim in life. And I want you guys to hear me because we can laugh really loud, but you know every single one of us in here is guilty of this. How much time do you spend thinking about your appearance? Your hair, your shoes, what you're wearing, how you're putting yourself off to others. Need to lose weight, need to gain weight. If I could just get there. I know, Jesus, he's my fulfillment. But man, if I could, if I could get this in my life, if I, could, if I could reach that level of achievement. You know what's crazy about social media? If social media doesn't tell you we are a self-actualizing society, nothing will. Social media is a place where you can pretend that you've gotten closer to self-actualization that you've actually gotten. And other people think, wow, they're getting closer than I am. They seem really happy. And it's really this big deceptive thing. 
but it looks pretty. Psalm 1611, God said in uh, your presence is the fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God wants me to have pleasure. Better pursue it. He wants me to do things for his glory. That means, man, I need to pursue this athletic accomplishment. If I could just get to college, if I could just make my, if I could just pursue this sport, man, and be successful then. I mean, for the glory of God, my kid could just get here. I mean, I know, I know we've not been around. I know we've not been around the Bible much. Not, I know we've not been around the local church much. But no, really, I mean, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He wants us to be great athletes. As we're thinking about these things, you know what the sad thing is about self-actualization? What's so um, crazy about it is that if you actually want to self-actualize, According to a worldly definition, biblically, you are a sinner. That means if you really want to be yourself, you need to be evil without restraint. I don't see that on the New York Times bestseller list. That's not fun. That's what we see in the synagogue. Everybody agrees that's wrong. Why? Because we know there's some standard. We know some standard we're falling short of. And we ultimately know when it says, in your presence is the fullness of joy, that's because it's in his presence. When it says, it's your right hand or forever more, that's because you're at his right hand. The fullness of fulfillment obviously is found in Jesus Christ. I think, on a side note, I think why many of you young people in here are so bored with Christianity is because you haven't actually tasted it yet. You've tasted some blend of I come to this thing on Sunday and I believe in God. In your 2 Timothy 3, 5, you have the appearance of godliness, but you deny its power. Man, there is power in the spirit of God. And when you taste him, you don't need other fulfillment. It's why in our minds, if you ever think of someone roughing it in Africa with the IMB, spreading the gospel without electricity, not able to take a bath, and you look at them and say, man, their life really stinks, you're a self-actualizer. The glory of God is found in the delight of God. Y'all know John Piper, if you do. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Second way we do this, we externally try to fix ourselves, make ourselves feel righteous. This isn't so much about um, <clears throat> feeling righteous as it is, there's not so much finding fulfillment, it is feeling righteous, okay? And this one is cultural identification. I don't know what to call it. This is what I'm calling it. I hope it works. I hope it makes sense. When I say cultural identification, I mean when we uh, think that we're better than others and we begin to judge others by how we affiliate politically, how we affili affiliate with legislative issues, how we affiliate with social issues, and how we affiliate and take stances on cultural hotspots over the word of God, we do this. And we embrace the tradition of men at the expense of the word of God, but it seems really righteous to be really passionate, but what we're really ignoring is bigger problems in the kingdom of God and deeper seated problems. So I want you to hear me during this portion. I don't want you to think it's bad to have a position or to care or even be passionate about public issues. I think we should. I think we should care. It's just that when you begin to judge others based upon them where you've gone wrong, okay? So here, I want to give an example, but I've got to use a really controversial example for us to feel it, okay? So I'm about to say something, and I don't want you to, I, I'm not taking any sides in here on this, but this is a good illustration for us to feel what I'm talking about. Okay, in the NFL, Colin Kaepernick during the national anthem takes a knee. This room's polarized, probably. And professing Christians have taken all kinds of stances against this. Like, hey, biblically, according to biblical values, I believe that's wrong. According to biblical values, I don't like it, but think he should be able to do it. And then according to biblical values, I just support it. And you know what? It's okay to have opinion on these things. It absolutely is. But you know what happens, you've seen it. You've seen it on Facebook, whatever, you've seen it in the public square. It's when Christians, professing Christians, take this and not simply develop an opinion over it biblically, but it becomes the measuring stick by which we view how righteous everyone else is. You don't got my cultural stance, well, you're blowing it because I'm the cultural blogger, I know it. Like, I got it, like God gifted me for this. You know, we tend to feel like that. When in reality, what are we doing? Oh, I'm making this, this is it. If I just take this stance hard enough, then that makes me righteous when Christian disunity is happening. 
and we're superseding over, we're coming over craftily, it seems good, opinions seem loud, they seem righteous, they got a Bible verse, but John 17, Jesus said the thing he was concerned most about us as a church was that we are one as he is the Father are one. So not only do we disrupt Christian unity for the sake of our tradition, our cultural expressions of righteousness, of how we feel, but we do it at the expense of losing witness to those who do not love Jesus. Because as soon as we get incredibly irritated and blow up over these things, and the outside world sees it, they, they, don't, they don't want what we have. They don't want that. That's how the world is. But man, when we approach these things in humility, and we have opinions, but we approach them in humility, and we're irritated, though, not most about what's going on in the public square, but we're irritated most about what's occurring in the kingdom of God and the states of people's hearts, that is when we're pushing into real righteous things that please God. These things are temporal. You know, there's a lot of things we could become irritated over. We could become irritated really desperately over where the Ten Commandments are and where they're not, whether there's prayer in schools or whether or not. Like, but I want to encourage you, none of those things change people's hearts. Like, if we go to most private Christian schools in Kentucky, you're going to see a lot of lost kids who have to pray in the morning. Why? It's because the gospel of Jesus Christ, that those things may be good. But man, our focus is zoomed in on the kingdom. And lastly, I think one more way we do this, <clears throat> probably the most tied to this text, supersede the word of God, blanket it for our ways, is religious affiliation. And religious affiliation, here, here's what I'll, I need to do this one a little differently. Because if I identify this one, and what it looks like, everyone in the room is gonna probably agree with me about it. And so I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna identify this one because I would say that the vast majority of the people in this room, you are a, you are a professing Christian. You would say, hey, yeah, I'm a Christian, okay? But instead, I wanna ask you a question. <clears throat> if someone came up to you and said, how do I become a Christian? What would you say? I want you to think about that in your mind. Somebody walks up to you and says, how do I become a Christian? What would you, how would you answer it? Now, stop. If you're not able to answer that question in your mind, I want to be really compassionate about this. I'm not trying to be rude. If you cannot answer that question, it is logically impossible that you have become a Christian. Because Christianity begins with truth. Christianity begins with a set of truths, with a set of information that we have to know. Christianity is not like some religious experience, some type of asceticism, like so many religions. No, Christians begin, Christianity begins with truth. And so I want to tell you, I want you to hear me really closely. If you're unsure how to answer that question, I want you to know that you are lost if you don't know how to become a Christian. Because if you can't tell somebody, how are you? Okay, also, some of you in your mind, this is how you answered that question. How do as a person become a Christian? You said, well, I mean, gotta believe in God. Gotta believe in God. Um, pray. You gotta pray a lot. Read your Bible. You need to be baptized. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I don't know how that's gonna help you, but maybe it's those things. Hey, I, it's just, well, you gotta love your neighbor. I wanna tell you, if that's your answer to your question in your mind, you are washing your hands. You're washing your hands. Okay, and so it's really important that we zone in on this. I want you to hear me. I want you to stay with me if you're like, man, I, I'm not really sure. Okay, I want you to stay with me because I wanna discuss how Christianity really happens. Not Christian affiliation, not that you, oh, congratulations, you made, it to, you made it to the gathering on Sunday. Because, I mean, really, if we're being honest, this is the easiest part of the Christian life right here. What's harder is what I get to work on Monday morning. I hadn't slept all night. That's when Christianity really begins, isn't it? Now, this is, this is central. This is important. I'm not saying the gathering is not important, but we need more than affiliation. We need Christianity, okay, because... Oh, man, so if, if you're listening, I want you to listen close because I want to talk about what your problem really is. 
Let's read chapter seven, verse 14. We'll read verses 14 and 15. We're gonna skip the middle section. We're gonna read 20 through 23. Starting in verse 10, it says, he called to the people again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Then he goes on to talk about, it's not about these foods that you're eating. It's not about any of these things you think it is. Then in verse 20, he repeats it again. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. What is fundamentally wrong with us is not even a list of actions you do. Yes, it's what comes out of you that defiles you, but that's only because of what's inside of you. Your fundamental problem is not that you've kind of made some mistakes in your life. Your fundamental problem is that your heart is corrupt. And so, hey, for those of you who are followers of Jesus who are Christians in the room, we ought to never grow tired of this, right? Because that's how we don't get tired of Jesus. If we're thinking about this, I wanna read you some texts about the human heart, about the human nature. Psalm 51, verse five, I've got three. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. What that means is this. Every single person in this room, including myself, is born a sinner. You don't kind of get there. You're born corrupt because you're a descendant from Adam. And Adam and Eve sinned, and we are all from them, so we've all inherited this sin nature, haven't we? Secondly, it gets worse. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. So this verse will put you on the floor. Are you kidding? No relationship with God, you're not a Christian. Even your good actions are evil because they're not for him. There is nothing that we do apart from the Lord that is good. Completely corrupt in the heart. And here's the problem we're seeing in the text. Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord God. I wanna tell you, if you didn't know that, answer the question, you're not sure how to become a Christian, you're not sure how you're gonna be washed, that is a really big problem. You can't, you can't wash it. You're trying to wash it off with soap, the Lord says you can't. The stain remains. You know what's ironic about all the Pharisees' attempts to fix what's wrong with them through external measures and all our attempts is that not only do we direct them at the wrong things, but when we actually find out what's truly wrong with us, we have zero power to change it. Nothing. No ability, no goodness. Now listen to me, I wanna talk about, somebody said, how do I become a Christian? I wanna talk about exactly what that looks like. Maybe you're like, man, I wanna know that at this point. This is the most important thing, and this is really important because no, hear me, unlike Rachel Hollis's book, which said any faith walk is fine, just pursue your priorities, I'm telling you, not arrogantly, that not any faith walk is fine. There's one that's fine, and there's one that's good, and there's only one way because there's only one of them that is gonna deal with your heart. So let's talk about this. Let's go back to the beginning when I talked about not having the right attire to get into the wedding. You're polluted, you're unclean. There's a reason I use that illustration because in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 22, there is this amazing thing where Jesus compares entrance into the kingdom of God to entrance into a wedding. You wanna come into heaven? You wanna be a Christian? Jesus compares it to a wedding. And he begins to tell this story and he talks about how there was this great king who invited all these people to a wedding and the parable is about heaven. It's about being in the presence of God and all these people were invited to the wedding. You're being invited today. You're being invited right now as I'm talking. All these people were invited. Look what happens. Matthew chapter 22 But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? 
And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I brought something today to show you what this man was wearing and what every single person in this room is wearing when you stand before the Lord. You're wearing your heart and this is what it looks like. We don't have the right attire to enter into heaven. What are you gonna do when you stand before God at judgment? Are you gonna tell him, Lord, look at this little white spot. You see? <laughs> look at this thing. And this isn't even half of it. This is an illustration of our hearts. How does a person become a Christian? There is only one way. And it's by faith to believe in Jesus Christ, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross for sins and he was raised from the dead three days later and ascended to heaven. And that he can deal with this sin. But I want you to stop. Because some of you in your mind who said, I didn't know the answer to that question or you said a bunch of other things, now you're saying, because I have this conversation with people every week, now you're saying, oh yeah, well, I know that, I, I believe that, I believe that. But here's what I think's likely about what you believe. You believe Jesus was raised from the dead, you just don't trust in what it means to believe in him and to lay down your life before him. Believing in Jesus is believing that something happens. Not believing that he's a person who died and raised. It's believing something happens. So what's happening? Because this is what we've got. And this is all you have. If you look at the next narrative of the Syrophoenician woman, she comes before him and said, Lord, I've got a daughter with an unclean spirit. I'm a Gentile. I'm a pagan. I don't know what to do. And this is all you and I can do is we can come before Jesus and we can say, Lord, I don't have anything else. This is all I've got but I don't know, I believe in you, I believe you died on the cross, you know what happens? Is he says, I want you to hand that to me. And so, you hand it to him. And here's what he does. He says, I'm gonna give you mine. I almost fell down. I'm gonna give you mine. This is the essence of the Christian faith. You, you get to put this on. You didn't earn it. You don't have any right to wear it. You're still guilty, but you're wearing Jesus's garments. You're getting into the wedding because of his life. This is his heart. This is his sinlessness. This is his perfection. It's not yours. It's alien to you. It's imputed to you. It's given to you graciously by him. You cannot earn it. You cannot wash enough. Mama got, ain't got enough Clorox for that shirt over there. Amen. It's this. It is the grace of God received by belief in Jesus Christ. And he gives this to us. In Revelation, it says we'll be dressed in pure and white linen. You know what he does with this piece of garbage? He put it on. He put it on and he got up on that cross and he took the wrath for your polluted, stained, guilty, unbelieving, unrepentant heart. And he paid every single ounce of it with his blood. And that's why we sing victory in Jesus because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross can give you righteousness that's not yours and a heart that beats for him. If you need to become a Christian today, I wanna say this is, this is it. You can earn this. We're not awesome. I'm not awesome. My goodness, spend a couple days with me. I'm a sinner. But I've been given a heart. Not only is righteousness where I'm innocent, but I've been given a heart that beats for him and I love him and I wanna serve him. I wanna lay down my life for him and I want the same for everyone in this room. All of this is out of grace. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, here's what I want you to remember. You're not wearing your clothes. You're not wearing your clothes. You didn't earn this. We didn't earn this. This was the grace of God. So our musicians come up. I wanna invite you. You don't have to 
walk down this aisle or something to be saved. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, to have forgiveness of sins. But if you do that today, I want you to come see me. At some point, come see a pastor, tell someone, because you need to be biblically baptized as an outward expression that faith has taken place in your heart. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much. God, we thank you this morning. We have nothing. We have your grace. We have the righteousness of Christ. Thank you, Lord. I praise your name. In Jesus' name.